my proposal for today is to uh, simply uh, run two 40 minute sessions with a 20 minute break in between. And uh, the first session I'd like to focus on uh, meta analysis. And in the second session on uh, grading of information to understand uh, and interpret the evidence considering its uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I also believe given that it is Friday, maybe two sessions will be appreciated better by colleagues who have joined uh, the webinar. So with this uh, brief description for today, we can proceed to my slide set. And uh, the first session will be concerning uh, data synthesis. And before we jump into data synthesis or, or statistical synthesis, uh, we should just remind ourselves that uh, we are dealing with uh, systematic reviews where we begin in the first step by framing question. In the second step, by identifying all the literature. In the third step, uh, extracting data, including data concerning study quality. And now in front of us is the question of how to present the information we have uh, collected. So the first thing about uh, data synthesis is that the large majority of information we have collected needs to be pre presented in form of uh, tables. So here uh, we can see a typical table of study quality, which we also saw in the last uh, webinar session. Basically the studies all have to be put in rows and then something said about them in columns. So this is the typical table structure uh, for table of any kind used in, in uh, meta-analysis, used in a systematic review or meta-analysis paper. And typically also in the last column, we tend to say something that summarizes uh, stuff written in the middle uh, columns. So in this particular table, for example, there is a description of the quality of studies, and uh, we can see here something about selection bias, measurement and performance bias, and attrition bias, and then a total score. Um, and then if you are engaged in a review that has 70, 80, 90, 100, 200 studies, you can see that a table will not fit on one page and in this situation, it's common to turn to summarizing this information in form of uh, graphics. Dr. Khaled, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, but we're not able to see your screen. And there's some issue just, with screen sharing. Uh, okay, we'll, 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 re, we'll reintroduce the screen. Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay, Ap apologies to colleagues for having missed this part. Uh, and uh, apologies also that I miss your message in the chat. So I was highlighting that tabulation is the first step. And uh, tabulation is, uh, is typically in the manner that studies in rows identified their identification uh, identifier in the first column and some summary of whatever is being said about these studies in the last column and details in the columns in between and here concerning study quality we have various individual items described and then totaled in the end and um, 
when you have 70, 80, 90, 100 plus studies, you can see that this information cannot fit on a page. So here we turn to summarizing information in form of graphs. And this is a typical graph used um, when summarizing large number of studies. So let's just look at some advice as to how best to prepare graphs. So here is a paper that gives guidance on what are the key principles for graph construction. So the first most important thing about graph is the caption. The graph need to be able to stand alone. So you need to describe it in as much detail as necessary so that it can be understood without the need for reading the text. Also remember that uh, on the first day I said to you that uh, the editor will probably read the title and the abstract and introduction, will not necessarily read the whole paper. But then after abstract and introduction, they will probably jump to looking at graphs and tables. So keep the possibility in mind that they are looking at your graphs and tables without having the benefit of reading the text. So they need to be able to understand everything that you want to convey through the graph uh, without, at one glance, without the need for them to have to read through the text to understand it. So the key thing is you need to define all the data symbols and abbreviations. Uh, it should be self-explanatory. And here is a specific advice that three-dimensional graphs should be avoided. In, and, and this advice is based on uh, the published science, which shows that three-dimensional graphs are not easily understood by human beings. So a graph should be standalone, avoid and spell out all the abbreviations. For example, in this graph of a systematic review, you can see that randomized trials are spelled out in short form with RCT, so that when the word RCT is used again, it can be readily seen within the graph as to what this means. Okay, so now we turn to another type of graph, which is summarizing a large number of studies where the only result you have is whether the finding is positive or the finding is negative. For example, in health economic evaluations, you may often find results presented as effectiveness is better, same or poorer. So this type of information can be summarized again in form of graphs. You can throw in some color coding if you wish. And you can state for each category of finding, the cost is high, the outcome is poorer, there are zero studies. On the other hand, uh, the cost is low and the outcome is better. Uh, and then you can use the color coding green. So nowadays, because journals are happy to publish graphs with color, take advantage of it and use it in a manner that helps with interpretation. So after some, uh, some things said about graphs and tables, we turn to meta-analysis. So for meta-analysis, uh, I'd like to take you back to how we calculate an effect size just so that it's all fresh in our minds. The first thing to remember is that your constructed research question is captured in a two by two table in this way. So the participants are right here uh, in the last column of the two by two table. The intervention and outcome are in the rows and uh, in intervention and control are in the rows and the outcome are in the columns. So each element of uh, your research question 
in this description of uh, the data. And then this data described in this way, and we take that example of a study with 200 people who were divided into two groups of 100 each, and the outcome was present amongst 10 in the control group and amongst 25 in the intervention group. And the re relative risk was calculated here as being 2.5. So I hope you can see that a single number, 2.5, captures virtually everything that you first imagined at the time of framing your question. <clears throat> and if the calculation is uh, by another effect measure called odds ratio, using the same data, this information is captured by a number calculated from the same data set, but it's a higher number, 3.0 instead of 2.5. So the effect measure you choose impacts on the number that you present in your paper. So at this stage, I'd just like to stop to offer you a chance to ask me any questions about the relationship of the research question to the two by two table and then to the effect measure that emerges from it. And as soon as we are comfortable with this calculation, we can then move on to discuss what is a meta-analysis. Okay, so with this background described, uh, we move on to, you will recall that the point estimate of effect that uh, we observed as being the calculation carried out in the previous slide is represented by uh, a dot or a box or uh, a square in the middle and the size of the study captured by confidence interval uh, is described by a line, a horizontal line that runs across the estimate of effect. And, uh, and the typical way of presenting studies, taking the same concept as we presented in the tables, that on the left-hand side, we have the studies described. And on the right-hand side, we have the result described. And the result can also be described graphically. And this graphic description on a scale, uh, where at the bottom, you can see the value one represents no effect. Um, 